Okay, so um, I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, and I want to first congratulate all of you on your acceptance to the University of Richmond. Um, I'm Critica on Sonnet. I'm the Director of International Student and Scholar Services and International Education. And I'm so pleased that you're able to join our international student webinar today, organized by our good colleagues in student development. We'll be discussing resources and programs that you can access over the summer to help with your adjustment to the university, as well as important forms and deadlines. And as you should be able to see on your screen to help you follow the presentation, we will be using PowerPoint slides which will be emailed to you after the webinar. Um, we will leave plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. So we ask that you hold your questions until after our presentation and type it into the Q&A. So first we're going to talk about arrival to the US. Um, and specifically resources for US embassies and consulates. So applying for a student visa is probably one of your biggest concerns at this point. And um, believe me, we share your frustration at the recent closures, cancellations and delays in visa issuances caused by the limited or in some cases non-existent operations of US embassies and consulates around the world. Um, especially in China, where we know there's a large number of applicants. Um, however, we are hearing about students in countries where the US embassy has been closed, such as Myanmar, um, who are getting visa appointments for June. And in a news article on May 7th, um, the acting consul general for the US embassy in Beijing announced that visa processing for Chinese students would resume this month with plans to handle 2000 applications a day by mid-May. Um, according to the April 6th Visa Services Operating Status Update on the US Department of State website, US embassies and consulates that process non-immigrant visa applications are prioritizing travelers with urgent needs, foreign diplomats, mission critical categories, such as those coming to assist with the pandemic, followed by students, exchange visitors, and some temporary employment visas. So, you know, you are um, being prioritized ahead of a lot of different types of visas. There are 22 different visa types to come to the US, so you're um, ahead of most of them, but you are not the first uh, priority because of those categories for urgent needs, diplomats, et cetera, who I just mentioned. Um, you may be able to apply for a student visa outside your home country if you are physically present in that country. And for specific information about student visa issuances at embassies or consulates, we would refer you to the website on this slide, usembassy.gov. Um, as you may know, each embassy and consulate in each country has their own timing and application rules and procedures, and we're just not knowledgeable about all of them. So um, really your best source of information is to go online um, and through usembassy.gov, select the embassy or consulate or diplomatic mission in the country in which you plan to apply and read the specific information for uh, visa issuance in that country. So now I'm going to talk more specifically about student visa applications. Um, <clears throat> citizens of Canada and Bermuda do not need to apply for an F-1 visa stamp. Uh, you still need to present a valid passport and I-20 for admission to the U.S. and pay the CVSB. F-1 students who attended high school in the U.S. can use the F-1 visa stamp from high school if it's still valid, along with the I-20 from Richmond. The only time the names of the schools on your F-1 visa stamp and I-20 need to be the same is the very first time you enter the U.S. as an F-1 student. 
So subsequent entries to the US when you go to college or graduate school, the names do not need to match because presumably the names did match when you entered the US for the first time to attend high school. Students who have never been in the US physically to attend school will of course need an F1 visa. <clears throat> and the last bullet point on our slide um, is the link to the US Department of State's student visa information and application processes. Now I'm going to talk about the national interest exception. So non-US citizens traveling from India, China, Iran, Brazil, South Africa, the Schengen area, the United Kingdom, and Ireland would normally be subject to a 14-day quarantine in a third country outside of these countries and the US before being eligible to enter the US. However, as, student, as a student, you qualify for a national interest exception if your academic program begins August 1st, 2021 or later. If you have a valid F-1 visa, you do not need to contact an embassy or consulate to seek an individual national interest exception to travel. You can enter the US no earlier than 30 days before the start of your academic studies. If you need to apply for a new F-1 visa, you should check the status of visa services at the nearest embassy or consulate. If you are found to be otherwise qualified for an F-1 visa, you will automatically be considered for a national interest exception to travel. Um, so entry requirements to the US. Um, F-1 students whose I-20 state initial status on the first page can only enter the US 30 days before your I-20 program start date, <clears throat> which should be August 15th, which is currently the arrival date for international orientation. Uh, you will need to present a valid passport, I-20, F-1 visa stamp, unless you're a citizen of Canada or Bermuda, and proof of student status. So that could be an admissions letter, a scholarship letter, your fall class schedule, payment of fees for the fall. Um, you don't need to bring every single one of these documents. Um, these are just a few suggestions. The US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC recommend that you do not travel internationally until you are fully vaccinated and require all airline passengers, including US citizens and fully vaccinated travelers to have a negative COVID-19 test result no more than three days before travel or documentation of recovery from COVID-19 in the past three months before boarding a US bound flight. Masks are required on planes, buses, trains, and other forms of public transportation traveling into, within, or out of the US and in US transportation hubs such as airports and train stations. And for more information, we encourage you to visit the link on the slide for the CDC webpage for international travel during COVID-19. So let's talk about travel related requirements specific to the Commonwealth of Virginia. So according to the Virginia Department of Health, there are no quarantine requirements for anyone arriving in Virginia from other locations. In Virginia, you should wear a mask in indoor and outdoor public settings if you are not fully vaccinated. If you are fully vaccinated, you are not required to wear a mask in most indoor and outdoor public settings, but you can choose to do so. And regardless of your vaccination status, you are required to wear a mask in healthcare settings, on public transit, public schools, correctional facilities, homeless shelters, or when required by a business. And for more information, um, you can visit the website on our slide here, which is the Virginia Department of Health Travel Related Requirements in Virginia. Now, I have not talked so far about requirements 
specific to University of Richmond's campus. And that is because there will be an announcement forthcoming about campus move in procedures, um, dates, et cetera, all the details that you would know about coming to campus. This will be sent to your Richmond email between June 1st and June 15th. So please continue to check your Richmond email throughout the summer. But at this time, you know, we really just don't have any information about moving into campus and requirements specific to that. Um, we know a lot of you probably have questions about vaccines, about what vaccines are recommended, um, what vaccines are acceptable. Um, and again, we are not able to address those questions um, through our office, but we encourage you to email COVID-19 support at richmond.edu for any questions about vaccines. So now I will ask my colleague, Diana Trin to talk about um, some programs and resources, including the new international student checklist. So in June, you will get an email from our office about the new international student checklist, which has information to read and forms to complete prior to your arrival to campus. The checklist also includes an online orientation with modules with topics covering academics, health and safety, immigration and employment, and other topics we want you to be familiar with prior to your arrival. Completing the checklist is mandatory for all new incoming international students, and the deadline to complete that is August 1st. If you don't complete the checklist by this date, we will place a hold on your student account. There are also additional forms that need to be completed after your arrival to campus. The deadlines to complete these items is August 27th, which is the end of the first week of classes. If um, it's really important for you to complete these post arrival items by this date and on time so that our office can register your record and see this and failure to do so can result in you falling out of F1 status. Okay, thanks, Diana. Um, and so our last topic before we get to questions and answers is um, campus orientations. So we will hold an on-campus international orientation from Sunday, August 15th through midday on Wednesday, August 18th, at which point you will be required to attend new spider orientation, which continues uh, through Saturday, August 21st. New spider orientation is required of all newly admitted students in the class of 2025. International orientation is required only for new international students who have never been in the US on a student visa. So students who attended high school in the US or who are dual citizens, permanent residents, or American citizens living abroad are not required to attend international orientation. And we will send you an email about international orientation in June about whether or not we are um, expecting you to attend. Um, students who are accepted into the Endeavor or Roadmap program will be excused from attending international orientation. International orientation will combine new international first years and exchange students from our partner institutions who are studying at Richmond for one semester or one year. The program will have information sessions on cultural and academic adjustment, uh, US laws, uh, maintaining your student visa status and immigration regulations, the healthcare system in the US, health insurance, and other important topics that are specific to international students. Um, there will be plenty of time for you to take care of practical matters such as shopping and setting up a bank account and mobile phone service. And there will also be plenty of social events with your orientation and advisor or OA group as well as joint social events with other orientation programs. So we hope it'll be fun. We hope you'll meet a lot of interesting people. Um, and it's going to be very informative, um, but we're also gonna have plenty of time for you to socialize 
and also get set up with your room and other um, practical needs on campus. Um, and in the last bullet point here, that's the web page on our site where a draft schedule will be available sometime in June. And we expect to have a final schedule available uh, sometime in August. So we encourage you to keep checking that web page. And so that's the end of our, the formal part of our uh, presentation. Um, we'd like to hear from you any questions that you might have. You can please uh, type it into the Q&A. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. So we've got a question here. Um, I'm from Russia. If I apply for a visa and attend a visa appointment in one of the countries listed in the proclamation, will I need to have a 14 day quarantine in a third country or as an international student, will I also qualify for a national interest principle? Okay, great question. So all students qualify for the national interest exception. Um, I mean, that's why this exception exists. Um, it, it's to basically exempt any student on an F-1 visa who is coming from one of those countries that I just named, whether you're coming directly from that country or whether you're going to another country that was named um, and applying for a visa there. So either way you're covered, right? So whether you're coming directly from Russia or if you're trying to apply for an F1 student visa in say Brazil, you'll still be covered under the national interest exemption. So I hope that answers your question. Um, if there are no available appointments for an F1 visa in my country of residence and other countries that I can visit for attending an interview, can I receive a visa later on in September or October uh, and come to Richmond later? So um, we have been advising that students arrive no later than the end of the drop ad period, um, which is usually the first two weeks of class. So it would be the end of the second week of class. I'm sorry, I don't have the calendar in front of me. Maybe Diana can look it up. But um, you know, you, you would really need to arrive um, in time for classes if possible, since we're offering only an in-person residential education this semester. Sorry, Diana, you're muted. You had a, a date. That, that would be um, Friday, September 3rd. Okay. The second week. Okay. Um, so that Friday, September 3rd date would be the absolute latest date you could arrive on campus. But if it looks like you're going to be late for any reason, please communicate with our office and your college dean. Um, because, you know, as you know, there's, there's no remote option and it, it is really important, especially as a new student that you try to get here as soon as you can and certainly no later than the start of class. Um, I'm a US citizen. I go to high school in India, but my parents are Indian citizens. If I'm traveling with my parents, will I need to have a 14 day quarantine period? Um, so that's a good question. Um, if you're a US citizen, then you know you would not be subject to that 14 day quarantine uh, requirement anyways. Um, if your parents are Indian citizens, since they do not qualify for that national interest exemption since they're not coming as students, um, it sounds like to me that your parents unfortunately would need to quarantine, but you would not. 
do parents need to attend the Richmond orientation? Um, so no, parents do not need to attend. Um, we do have, along with new spider orientation, some parent specific information sessions. Um, and that will be part of our orientation schedule that we'll have on our website in June. Uh, we plan on offering, uh, I think an hour long information session just for international parents followed by a campus tour again, just for international parents. Um, but as you might guess, the orientation is really planned mostly for the students. And so while we do have some things for parents, it's not going to be the majority of the program. Um, should I attend international orientation or roadmap if I'm admitted to roadmap? So I would encourage you to look at the schedule um, of what's being planned for both of those programs to decide which program uh, would benefit you more. Um, you know, we've certainly had international students opt out of international orientation to attend Roadmap and had a great experience there. And that's fine with us, which is why I said that we will excuse you from, inter uh, from attending international orientation to attend Roadmap. But I think it's up to you, um, you know, to look at what's being offered by both programs and choose the one that you think would be the most beneficial for you. What else? What can we answer? Okay. Um, details about whether it will be possible to get vaccinated as an international student at Richmond. Or is this question to be addressed to COVID-19 support? Yes, so if you could please uh, email that question to that COVID-19 support email. Um, our colleagues in the Student Health Center are better situated to answer these kinds of questions. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So the email is COVID-19 support at richmond.edu for vaccines. What else can we answer for you? All right, if the situation with visas will not resolve, by what date can we make a decision of deferral? Okay, um, and then somebody else is asking about deferring admission to the winter term. Okay, so we will refer you to our good colleagues in international admissions for deferrals. Um, I know that you have to make a request to defer your admission to the Office of Admission. So I think probably most of you have been in touch with Amanda Gearhart in international admission, and I would, I would contact her for any questions about deferring either to the spring. Um, we, we don't have a winter term. So if you defer, it would have to be either for attendance in a fall or spring um, semester only. Yes, thank you. So there's uh, Ms. Gearhart's uh, email address there and the generic email for international admissions. Thank you. What else? All right, so 
recommendations on which US embassies to apply to for a visa. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's so specific that it, it's very difficult for us to actually recommend a location or a specific embassy or consulate where you could go um, to apply for an F1 student visa. I think that, um, you know, you should first obviously check the embassy or consulate in your area to see what their schedule is, the wait times and those kinds of things. Um, if you know of other students who are going to the US around the same time that you are, you might wanna see where people are applying for visas. But yeah, unfortunately we just don't know enough about the operations and the ease of applying for visas at different embassies or consulates around the world to, to be able to recommend a specific one. Any other questions? Doesn't have to be about visas. Maybe you're wondering something about the campus, about the culture. Okay. All right. Um, seems that getting an appointment for a visa and for non residents in Eurasia is challenging. If we will need to go to a Schengen country or other states where an additional visa is required, are there any programs that may financially help us to obtain an additional visa to a third country? Okay, so um, it sounds like you're asking about whether there's financial support to travel to a country outside of your home country to apply for a visa in that country. Because of course you would need a tourist or some other visa to go to that third country. Um, so for that, I would refer you again to our colleagues in international admissions. Um, Ms. Gearhart, um, could answer that for you because as you're probably aware, international admissions also um, handles the um, financial aid and scholarship um, to newly admitted students. So that's a question you want to ask of them. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, if there are no more questions, um, this, um, this webinar is being recorded. So I suppose we'll make a copy of that uh, available to you. And we are also going to get um, the uh, list of attendees for this webinar so that we can email that PowerPoint presentation to you and all the links in it that are gonna be useful to you. Um, thank you again for coming to our webinar and congratulations on your acceptance. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on campus very soon. Thank you.